Hey everybody, Mike here. So what makes a CubeSat a CubeSat? You've probably seen pictures of CubeSats before, and they all look pretty similar. That's because they're all based on something called the CubeSat design specification. The CubeSat concept was developed back in 1999, and the goal was to make it cheaper and easier for smaller groups like universities to get a satellite launched into orbit. If you're a big satellite maker, if you're trying to launch something big into orbit, you're basically buying the entire launch. It's your launch. And you need to reserve these launches so far in advance that you can design your satellite and the mounting specifically for the rocket that you're using. For smaller groups, this isn't really affordable. You're not buying or, or renting or using the entire launch yourself. So for these smaller groups, you need to design your satellite as a secondary payload. So you're just riding along with somebody else's launch. And the CubeSat design, the CubeSat design specification is to make it easier for you to become one of these secondary payloads. It's a lot like container shipping here on Earth. You can take your goods and load it into a shipping container, and you don't need to care whether that container is then going to go on a truck on a train, or on one of these big container ships. It's a standardized interface to make it easier to ship your satellite. The CubeSat idea is the same concept. You build to this CubeSat design specification, and then it makes it much easier for your satellite to go onto any launch that has space available. So let's take a look at this CubeSat design specification. Okay, so this is the CubeSat design specification. And the first thing to note is that this has a specific revision, revision 14.1. So you can find the most recent um, version on the CubeSat.org website. So it's important that you keep track of changes over time. Uh, I'll show you some of the things that have been kind of recently added and new additions as we go through it. But the main thing to take away is that the spec is evolving over time. So if you're building a satellite like I am, you want to keep track of what's changing. So if we start with the introduction, this is like I mentioned earlier. So the CubeSat project was actually started by some universities. Uh, collaboration, collaboration between a few professors here. Again, to make it easier to get satellites into orbit. So there's some good pictures to wrote here, but this one's interesting. This is the very first CubeSats, and you can see the CubeSats uh, on the desk. And then these long gray things, these are the launchers. So the idea is the launchers, or these ones are called P-pods, are these long uh, tubes or, or square tubes and you load the CubeSats into them. So these ones can hold three U's worth of CubeSats. So either three individual one U CubeSats or some combination of bigger CubeSats. And then those launchers then integrate with the launch vehicle. So the idea is me building the CubeSat, I don't need to care about the interface with the launch vehicle. Whoever's providing me that service of launching my CubeSat, they're going to take care of that interface. They're going to take care of launching or integrating, I should say, the P-Pod with the launch vehicle itself. This is a good illustration of the different sizes of CubeSats. So I talked earlier about this 1U concept. So you can see 3U here, that's the size of that standard P-Pod launcher we just saw. So inside that, you could have one 3U CubeSat taking up that whole volume, or three 1Us, a 1 and, and a 2, or 2 1.5, right? You can do different combinations of these, but it's the same launcher. So as the satellite builder, it takes a lot of that complexity away. For me, the satellite I'm building I am trying to maximize my ability to get this thing into orbit. That's kind of my whole goal. So I'm using the CubeSat specification to maximize compatibility, and I'm going to target a 1U CubeSat. 
So I'm taking up as, as little space in one of these launchers as I can. But as I'm designing, particularly my electronics, my battery, my power, I'm going to design those to support one U, but also make it so they could scale up to support one of these bigger CubeSats in the future if I eventually want to send up a bigger payload. So I'm going to start with one U, but I want to give myself the flexibility to do more. Okay, so now we're looking at the actual CubeSat specification. And there's a lot of individual things here. I'm not going to go through all of them, just the high level basics. And really this general section is just making sure you're not trying to do anything too weird. Um, so all parts shall remain attached to the CubeSat during launch, ejection, and the operation. So you can't have your CubeSat kind of splitting into multiple pieces or falling apart or anything like that. Pyrotechnics, so basically there's a lot of standards to control what might be in your CubeSat that might go boom during a launch or anywhere near anybody else's payload. So all of these things serve to limit uh, the risk to other satellites. The mechanical specifications are where most of the detail in the specification live. And I'll look at some drawings which has a bit more kind of interesting detail, but this is where it defines the size of your CubeSat. So this is the dimensional drawings for a 1U CubeSat. And you can see the focus is on these gray rails. The rails are what actually touch against the, the, the P-Pod deployment system. And the yellow parts, you can actually stick up a little bit. You know, if you have solar panels that protrude a little bit from the system, and all of this is to make sure that you can fit within the deployer. As we go up, you can see 1.5, 2U, 3U, and then this is where you start to, if you're taking up 3U, you get access to the small amount of space at the back. This, uh, they call it the tuna can. This is basically a little bit of extra space inside the spring that pushes the CubeSat out. So 3U, 6U, and 12U, you get access to that additional volume. It almost looks ideal for some kind of propulsion sticking out the back, or maybe a camera. And then you get into the bigger ones. This is 6U, and then it goes up to 12U. And all of the mechanical specification is being very specific about the rails, what they're made of, the dimensions, and everything about how they fit into the launcher. You can see here a picture of the launcher. <clears throat> These are the rails that your satellite fits within. This is the spring pusher that just pushes your satellite out when it's ready to launch. And you can see that circle there, that's where that tuna can volume goes inside that spring uh, which launches your satellite out. Then the last thing I wanna look at for the mechanical specification is these four corners. And what you see here is in red, they have what they call deployment switches. So the idea here is there have to be some mechanical switches that when your satellite is in the deployer up against other satellites or against the back of the deployment system, on the red corners, those buttons are pushed in, they're depressed. And those become your inhibit switches for keeping your satellite off while it's going through the launch and waiting for it to be deployed. So that's kind of the crossover between the mechanical specification and the electrical specification. You've got the mechanical specification, how it fits in, and then these mechanical switches, your deployment switches, which turn on the electronics once the thing is actually deployed which brings us to the electrical specifications here, which is actually much shorter. It's basically saying that while your satellite is in the launch vehicle, everything has to be turned off. It's saying your battery effectively has to be disconnected from the rest of the satellite until it's deployed. There are a couple exceptions that you're allowed to have connected. So battery protection circuitry, your battery management system. 
uh, a real-time clock. You're allowed to have that powered up as long as it's um, isolated from the main power. Your clock has to be lower than 320 kilohertz. It has to draw less than 10 milliamps. So it's really constraining what you can have powered on and running while your satellite is in the launch vehicle. It also has this RBF pin, remove before flight. The basic idea is this is another inhibitor. When this pin is inserted into the satellite, it needs to keep everything turned off. As you can see, the basic point of this specification is to make sure that your satellite fits in the launcher and to make sure it doesn't interfere with any other payload in the launcher or on the launch vehicle. So you can see there's a huge amount of detail on the mechanical specifications. Uh, that is not my specialty. So there's a lot I'm going to have to learn on how to design and then have the mechanical components manufactured. Uh, so expect a lot of learning there. On the electronics, I've got more of a background on the electronics side. I'm an electrical engineer by education. So I'm probably gonna start there and I'm gonna look at the kind of bare minimum electronics that I feel would make for an interesting satellite. So I need solar panels. I want this to be powered by the sun, which means I need batteries to be recharged. So a bare minimum of a system to take in that solar panel power, charge the batteries. I've got the requirements from the specification on the mechanical switches, so that inhibit concept, the remove before flight pin. And then as a bare minimum, I need some kind of communication. When I'm developing the satellite, some kind of communication for me to program and debug the components in the satellite. And then for after launch, some kind of communication for sending telemetry from the satellite. At a bare minimum, I want some kind of a beacon to transmit from orbit down here to Earth on the basic status of the satellite. Anything beyond that is a bonus, but that gives me a good starting point. So expect a lot more videos coming up on all of that. All right, I'll see you next time.